Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing this fine Wednesday? Anybody feeling a little more anxious than usual today for no apparent reason? <laughs> oh, Max. <laughs> I know, I was all ready to teach, but it didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I meant by, for no apparent reason whatsoever. <laughs> I think I stayed up till like midnight. <clears throat> Probably drank a little too much. Still kind of, you know, maybe today will be a short day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's not bad. It's a little patchy. <clears throat> Kind of started growing the beard a little bit into October and haven't done anything to it since. And now we're into no shave November. So, I mean, why stop now, right? Although I got a thing right here, this mustache. It's, uh, it's a little ridiculous. <laughs> You're saying it by Christmas. Yeah, it might be gray by Christmas too. <clears throat> All right, what are we doing today? Uh, I guess I'm talking about basic auth. So here's what I got on my notes for today. So for the last project, if, uh, if you don't have a grade yet, I think there's at least two people, maybe a few more now. Um, if you don't have a grade yet, you either haven't submitted it or uh, I think I sent you a note in Slack about something not working. So go check your Slack. Go. Uh, make sure that things are good. Um, <clears throat> I would really like to get project four graded by the time project five's done, you know? And uh, yeah, so project five, speaking of, I uh, put a poll kind of thing in, not really a poll, but just a post where you could put like little re replies, one, two or three in there. So go check that out. I put it in Sunday, November 1st. It's kind of a question of what do we want to do for the next project or two projects? We could have one project or we could have two projects. Um, we could have one React project, one Docker project, or a smaller React and smaller Docker project and have both of them. I think right now the two small ones are winning, so that's pretty cool because I have the... I have the React one pretty much ready to go, and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do for the Docker ones that'll actually make sense with what we have set up so far, um, but also be like, download this container and run it, and there you go, because a lot of what we did. <clears throat> yeah, React is important, and so is Docker, so both are better. Okay, all right. I feel like I'm probably not going to get too much knowledge out of Docker. I suppose we could make our own Docker container for Node.js. It's not really what you should do in production, but uh, like in production, there's just a Node.js container that's way better. 
but if we make our own container, then you're actually going to learn how, how Docker files and Docker build and Docker run works. So maybe we'll just reinvent the wheel for, for Node.js. Uh, it is in the general channel. It's not a poll. It's just a post. It's the only post on Sunday, November 1st. And you just click one of the emoji, the blue one, the blue three, or the blue two. Looks like three is now up to 11. Some people found it recently. <clears throat> is there one where we could do both React and Docker and have it be a bigger project? Or No, because like we aren't really, there's no reason to host React inside of a Docker container. Gotcha. Um, and the React one, like, I, I kind of want to separate them so that I have enough time to teach React for that project and then enough time to teach Docker for that project. Otherwise, I'll be hopping back and forth while y'all gotcha. are working on the project, so. <clears throat> All right, makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And React, at the end of the day, should compile down to static JavaScript and HTML files, so really putting those React files into a Docker container is not going to be very impressive. You just like mount some static files into a Docker container. Although we could have a container build those static files. I don't know. I don't know. I got some ideas. I got a little bit of time to think about it. Um, I'm thinking the final project will be due the day of the final or the the day that finals start, like right before finals start, but then the late period will push it over to the day of finals, um, to the day of our final, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> so still trying to figure that out. Are we still doing a exemption for finals? Yep. If you have, uh, what did I say, 89.5? I think 89.49, 89.49. So, project four, you guys got that figured out. <clears throat> um, talked about project five, so that's this stuff down here. I'm already jumping around some, so let's just move that note up a little bit. <clears throat> uh, so, how many of y'all are still a little bit unclear about res.status, res.send, res.json? I saw somebody who was trying to do res.set earlier today or earlier this week to send some stuff to the client. So uh, should I talk a little bit about that? Or are y'all all good? I'd be down for that. <clears throat> okay. So if we go to, actually, where's my, I don't think I have code that I can show you guys. Oh, wait, I can go to browser and then pull it up. Not showing you my completed project five code, but there is a way to, so there's something like this. Let's go back to this. <clears throat> All right, so we have this, a lot of times you just want to end it. You don't want to send anything back. So send status, anything that does a res.send, that also ends the connection. So if you do a res.end afterwards, uh, you don't really, you, you, it's going to break. I think your application will crash or something because you've already ended that response by doing a res.send. So res.json, res.send, and res.send status, those end the connection. So these three, I believe, these three end the connection, <clears throat> end connection, and status just sets the status. So you would do something like res.status 401, and then if you wanted to attach a message to it, you would do .json error not allowed. And I think that would work and it would also end it. Um, send status just sets the status to something and in, you know closes the connection as well. So anytime that you're in an if statement and like you're, uh, for example, trying to send like a, hey, you're not allowed to be here. I'm gonna send you a 401. 
send status would work great for that because you don't have to tell people what the error is. Postman tests for, for this project for like that app.use piece doesn't really care. Um, Postman doesn't look for any words or anything. It's just like, hey, I got a 401 back. That's what I was expecting. All right, cool. So you don't really need to attach anything else like that to it. You can just call res.send status 401. But be sure after you do that that you return because let's say you're in like if not, you know, no username in um, basic auth, <clears throat> something like that. And you have code like this and you have res.send status and then you leave out the return and then you have a if, you know, we did look up, didn't find user, res.same thing. That's gonna break. That's gonna break because there's no, this does not end your function. And if you don't put a return here, it's just gonna fall through to the next if statement and run that. And now you've tried to end your re, uh, response connection twice. So if you do the same thing with a res.send with some data in it or some words in it, you know, something like that, I believe that ends the connection as well. And most of the time, besides send status, I think everything else is going to be res.json. It will be pretty much what you need. Uh, if you guys recall, res.json sets a status of 200. It sets the content type to application JSON, and it will convert some data. It'll convert this into a JSON string and attach it as the body of the response. So this is pretty much what you need. A lot of times you might want to do something like res.json uh, user object comma and you might want to spread that out. So now it takes all the keys in user object and puts it into this thing. And then if user object doesn't, for example, have a ref variable, then you would add it like this slash, oh, I guess it's, let's grade object, right? And then it would be grades. Uh, let's do this with back ticks to be fancy. Grades slash uh, grade object dot ID, something like that. So this will actually send back the grade object with an additional reference key like so. I believe in the code I gave you guys, let me go to the redacted one. Um, I did not. Okay, so in all of these, where's the get students? Okay, so this one right here, you're going to need to save how many things you get back before you put it through the, the filter. So this promise.all consolidate responses after this point, if you write your code correctly, you should have an array. So, you know, inside promise dot all dot then whatever totally pseudocode this is never going to work but <clears throat> you're inside all this and you have like uh all students equal you know it would equal some sort of array with student one object in it and student two object you'd have a bunch of objects in it like this and these are all the things that your multiple database queries have populated right so every time you did h get all so you do s members async that gives you the list of the student ids you do h get all on each one of those students <clears throat> That gives you back one of these objects. Hopefully the dot then for this, for each one, saves it into this bigger array. We talked about this earlier. Um, so then you have an array. And once you get to promises at all, you have a variable somewhere that's got this array and it's got objects in it. And eventually you wanna do filter sort paginate all students, right? But before you do that, <coughs> You're gonna need to remember what the length is of this thing. 
because you have to set the X total count header, which I believe I mentioned in the project for documentation. Let's go look at that real quick. X total, was it total count? No, that's project four, that's why. <clears throat> project five, all right. All right, so any filtering required blah, remember to save the number of results for X total count before applying any filters. So filtering does not actually write out this header. Filter sort paginate does not even take in the res object. If we go back and look at filter sort paginate, it just takes in some query arguments, the items that you want to filter, the type item you want to filter, all that jazz. But it doesn't have any ability inside here to do res dot set whatever, you know. So you can't do it here. So before you pass stuff into this, I'm going to need to do something like total count equals all students dot length and then do this and that's fine and then when you're actually building out the final thing to send out I believe I think res dot set is the thing to use no uh, express js res, what is it response Let's go look, response object, set, sets the responses HTTP header field to value. So you can do this, or you can even do it with multiple ones, but we don't really have to set multiple ones. We just have to set one. So if we go back to our sublime, here we have like all students, it's now been filtered. I didn't put all the stuff in here. I'm leaving that for you guys to fill out, but let's assume all that worked. <clears throat> res dot set x total count total count and then you can do your res dot json pretty much whatever you got back here right so this thing let's say it's like filtered filtered students and if we go up and look i think it does actually return a new array of items. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't actually modify items. This filter doesn't delete stuff. Okay, so it should be okay to even do something like, don't quote me on this, but I think you should be able to do something like that because I don't think filter sort paginate modifies the length of all students. It will sort all students for you. No, it won't. It should not modify all students at all. So I think even this would work. But if you wanted to be safe, you could do it this way. And this actually, this one closes the connection, but this one sets the header. And for the ones where you're returning multiple, like get students and get grades, you got to set that header and that header has to be the length before you filter it. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of all the stuff about res. And if you really want to learn more about it, you can go over here. This sets the status code. Um, but if you look at like res dot send status and sends its string representation as the response body. Um, so it doesn't, this is where express documentation isn't great because it doesn't tell you which one actually uh, like ends the request and which one doesn't. And like if we look at res.end, uh, method actually comes from node's core, used quickly in the response with IMA. instead use res.send or res.json and send status also ends it, but I don't think they actually say that. Send file probably also sends it, but they don't actually say that, so. I guess they do here. So res.status.send. So that's, they at least say it in their comments, but they don't specifically say like, this one terminates the connection, this one doesn't, you know? So you kind of, you might need to play around with it, make sure that your stuff isn't like 
ending the connection that you're returning if you're trying to do it inside an, of an if statement, all that jazz. Um, any questions about the response object for Express.js? Project 5 extension to Wednesday 11th because of fall break plus election stress. Negative. I did not plan for election stress when I scheduled it, but I did plan for fall break. And hey, I'm just as stressed as you guys, and I'm still working all day. So that's a big negative on that one. And if I push that one back, I might have enough, might not have enough time for the next two projects. So we got to start moving and shaking on React next week, y'all. Overlapping. No, I'm not going to do that. Come on. That's just kicking the can down the road. Then you're just not going to finish the next project on time. <laughs> Cries and stress. <laughs> yeah, we will. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, y'all knew that fall break was coming a month and a half ago. Y'all were so excited for it. Don't tell me y'all were like, I was the only one surprised that we had fall break on Monday. All y'all knew it was already there. So <laughs> Okay. All right. Apparently I'm not the only one that doesn't look at the uh the calendar. <laughs> Well, all right, let me just see. Let me go over here real quick. Okay, so two people, two people have submitted Project 5 so far. That's, uh, that's actually pretty on par with where we are on every other project with five days to go. So I'm not feeling like this is, this is holding you guys back too much. I don't know. <laughs> there's the ruin in the curve jeez <laughs> i've been away from my main pc for a week well you know in the new world where you get to work from home you may need to learn how to work without having your main, P main pc with you grinding mount on wow oh so speaking of games and y'all are just going to make this class last longer because we're talking about games now <clears throat> I finally, Valve finally told me they're shipping me my index soon. So, and they finally took my money for it. So yeah, I'm going to have a VR headset soon. And then tonight I'm actually getting together with some old friend to play some Star Wars Armada. Ha ha ha. So it's going to be a good week trying to take my mind off of things, you know? No, I didn't try the index. I have people that have headsets already. They don't have the index, but <clears throat> the specs look good. And I really want the, you know, the finger support. And that seems like cutting edge, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've was staying away from Rift ever since the uh ever since Facebook started hinting it they would they would be doing that. They've been hinting at it for like a year though. Access to index if you give extension. I got an index. Man, I waited three months since I placed the order. If I could wait three months, I can wait another week or two. I don't need to give you guys an extension. Yeah, it'll be all right. I'll survive another week. <laughs> that sounds like a you problem right there, my friends. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I bet there is a jailbreak. Okay, so the one other thing, and maybe we can get back to complaining about how Project 5 is so unfair. It's the biggest project ever. Okay, I've been getting so many fucking phone calls. Um, thank God for Google Screen. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? We can complain more about the project after we get this stuff done. I do want to talk about basic auth headers. You all, I think I've talked about it once. Pretty sure y'all don't remember it. Oh, somebody's actually checking.
Okay. Amazon's trying to tell me somebody did something with my account. I'm going to have to go look at that in a minute. Anyway, basic auth headers. It's going to be on the quiz. Talked about them before. It is one header, one header line. When you make a request, yeah, well, I mean, I got like two factor auth on everything, so I don't know how I'm getting hacked. $120 in being shipped to Ohio, but it's probably actually, I bet you it's a, uh, it's a spam call that's like, all right, well, you just need to give us your social security number and credit card so we can validate that it's you, you know? So if I had any problems, they would probably email me and yeah, I don't answer phone calls from Amazon. F that. I don't answer phone calls from anybody. Don't try and call me. <laughs> Get off of my phone. <laughs> Basic auth headers. Start with authorization. That is the name of the header. Except I don't think I spelled authorization. Yeah, okay. Fingers worked right the second time. So this is the name of the header. The value of the header <clears throat> is basic. And then space and some base 64 which those characters I don't think are all in base 64, but whatever. Something probably has an equal at the end for padding, whatever. Basic, uh, base 64 encrypted string. What is that base 64 encrypted string? And by encrypted, it's actually just encoded. Their base 64 is not an encryption, it's just a different number space for letters that has 64 slots per character, right? So they use uppercase and lowercase and equals and slashes and a couple other things to make um, a character where uh, a number space where each character can represent 64 different things. Go over API protection section with basic auth when I get a chance. Yes. So you don't have to know, know how this stuff works for the project because this thing here does it no wait not that thing uh this thing this thing right here does it for you auth looks in the request object and returns creds creds is just has a name and it has a pass and that is all that's in there how does it get that you may ask well there we have this basic auth header that postman is attaching to every request and if you base64 decode it, it is a username, colon, password. It is the most insecure thing ever. Because if you don't send this over HTTPS, anybody can, it's not even like grabbing your cookie. They can actually be you. They can see your username and your password. It's not great. But we're using it for this just because we're using it for this because it's easy. Um, so you take this. Let's see, take this and base64 encode, and then add it here. And if this header is attached, then you should let the, well, if this header is attached and the username exists and the password for that username when salted or hashed or whatever, uh, all of that matches what's in the database, then if somebody comes in with the correct credentials, you should let them through. Let's go back and look over here for a second. Remember how we said, how I said that this just is gonna fall through because there's no breaks. So whenever you get a get or a post or a put or a delete any of these things, it's going, to, it's going to run your code. And if it's anything other than that, like an options or head or something, then you just allow it on through with next. Most of the stuff, like all of the things you're defining down here that I've defined and you're filling out are all post, put, delete, all that jazz. Get, post, put, and delete. So those are the only ones we really need to protect because they aren't gonna be able to do anything against your database or your API because your API is only these four. It's not all of the HTTP methods. A little refresh on app.use. App.use gets called on every request in order. So all three of these functions gets called on every request. <clears throat> That's great because you actually have to, and 
furthermore, when it doesn't advance to the next one until you call next inside this request or inside this app.use function. So here's a good example of an app.use that just sets some response headers and then lets it fall through to the next thing. And this is apparently another way to set a response header because we did res.set, but res.header, does that still exist? Um, no, I don't see res.header anymore. They might have changed it, but we don't need that anyway. So we don't we don't need this code anyway. So because our we're running everything off the same server now. Well, previous projects we weren't, but yeah, this should be fine. Um, should be. Yeah, I ran my code and it worked. Yeah, okay. So I did test my code. Okay, yeah, res.set is probably better to use in your code, but hopefully this is not breaking your code um, because this is you know my part of the code. I don't think it's breaking anything. Anyway, if we delete this next, nothing will ever come back from the server because it gets to this app.use, it calls its next, it gets to this app.use, it sets some headers, it never calls next. Nothing ever does a res.send in this function. And if you never call next, it does not advance to the next app.use. And if there, or if there are no more app.uses, it also does not advance to any of the specific things. Not breaking my code, breaking my heart. Oh. So if we don't call next here and we don't call, so we could do so. So we need next there. And then so this one has a next inside of it. Like this returns function. This whole thing is a function. We call it, it returns a function. That gets regis registered as our first app.use. Here's a little bit of a different one. We define our function in line here. It has a next call in it. So no matter what, once it runs these four lines of code, it will allow Express.js to progress to the next app.use or app.get or whatever, whatever's next in line. Hence the word next. Uh, turns out that because we define this next, this is next in line. So you get in here and you either, if you want the browser to not just spin forever or really what will happen is Nginx will probably do like a proxy timeout after a minute. Um, so your browser or Postman will spin for a minute. It will never get a response back because you haven't filled out this code yet. So you either, if everything is good, call next, else they aren't allowed. So you call res.send status 401. So you either allow it to go to the next function or you just end the, end the entire request and response like back and forth right here before it even gets to any of the rest of your code. How do you verify, you may ask, what these creds are supposed to match up to? Well, at the very top, every time that we start up this code, we call set user and we make this user object. So there is a user object with an ID of teacher, a salt that we just now generated, and a hash that we just now generated. And every, this is generated every time Node.js starts, it overwrites whatever was previously in the Redis database, or if there was nothing in the Redis database, it just puts it in there. It puts it in as user colon user, so it would be user colon teacher, right? And then it would have, because the ID here is teacher, so user colon this thing, this teacher, and then it just saves the user object directly into this hash. The hash name, again, is user colon teacher. So down here, you have this creds.name. If I'm trying to actually get through, there's only one user in the database, I probably need to pass a creds.name as teacher, which means you will probably need to look up the username teacher and get the user object out. And when you get that user object out, it will have a salt on it and it will have a hash on it. And you can kind of figure out what you need to do from there. You can pretty much just take this line of code here and modify this, but you have to do it inside of the database lookup to actually get the user object first. Does that make sense? 
So you need to check the database, see if user ID colon creds.name, right? See if this user colon bleh, this user, yeah, not user ID, user colon bleh, see if that exists in the database. See if you actually get an object back if you try and look it up with like hgetall. Use hgetall, user colon creds.name. Gives you an object back or doesn't. And if it doesn't, in the connection, they tried to log in with a user that doesn't exist. Once you got that, once you have the user object back and it actually existed and all that jazz, you will have the user object.salt and you will have the creds.pass, the password that they actually tried to use, the salt for the user that is stored into the database. You combine those two with this here, using this here line, and you compare it to the hash object that is in the database or that came from the database. If all of that works, if they match, call next and do not use the res object to send anything to the client. So you call next and you just like, all right, well, the next thing down the line will handle your request. All I'm doing is trying to be a gatekeeper to tell you you can't come through. I'm not trying to answer you if you can come through. And that's what this function does. It does not respond to the user unless it is preventing the user from getting to the next function. Any questions? That was a little long-winded, I, I know, a little rambly. Filter sort paginate. So the inputs, where are we? The inputs are type. This thing, is, type is either going to be student or it's gonna be something else, probably grades, right? So you're either gonna pass in a type of student or you're gonna pass in a type of grade so user, uh, okay, let's go back. So user object will have something called hash from the database. Yeah, so if you do something like client.h get all async user colon plus creds dot name dot then And in here, we should get an object back. We call it, even call it user object, right? So we should get this back. Now this may be, might be false or null or undefined. Check for that. You might want to just like run it and see when you put in a random name, what it gives you back. Uh, I can't remember if it's null or undefined, but all three of those are, are loosely comparable to fault. So if you do like, if not user object, res.send status 401 and return. Just, well, okay. Well, yeah, that needs to be in there. So I'm not using any, I'm not doing any fancy curly braces or anything. This is all pseudocode yet again. But uh, yeah, you would do something like that if you don't get the user object. But if you do get a user object, it is this thing, plus we set a hash afterwards. So I couldn't set the hash because I needed the salt, right? So I can't sit here and do, like the, way, the reason I wrote it this way with hash being outside of it and being added in later is I can't do hash colon this thing directly in here. Why can't I do hash colon? Because we're, we're in the middle of making user object. User object doesn't exist yet. Now, if I made the salt ahead of time, then I could do that. So a little bit, you know, I guess to make this a little bit cleaner, I could do something like salt colon salt, const salt equals that and then put a comma in that, and then this would just be salt. So that is the same thing, right? So we just have, we set the salt, we set the ID, we set the hash using the password is testing and whatever salt we just generated up here. And then we don't need this object or this, uh, this call, this line here, and set user takes this, stores it in the database. So when you look up hgetall here, if you looked up teacher, for example, you should get this exact object back. It should have the hash in it, should have the salt in it. Even if it's written like this, it will still have the hash and the salt and the ID in it because we're just setting the hash. Uh, okay, 
We're just setting the hash on the user object afterwards. So it's a little bit different. I could have put, I could have done salt first or you set the hash after. I decided to set the hash after. So sue me, maybe it's not the most readable thing. I kind of wish I had changed it, but good question. Um, so you should get that back or nothing. And I'm not sure what value of nothing, whether it's null, undefined, or anything. I would not do like a double equals or triple equals here. I would just do not user object because if you have false or null or undefined, all three of those will satisfy this conditional. And boom, you end the connection, you return, and you really need to make sure you return after you send status here because you don't want to do something like, okay, well then if hash, you know, compute hash, if hash user dot hash actually you'd probably do not equals and then you'd probably do another res dot send status 401 and if you don't have this return here you're now sending two things two different responses this one has already closed it this probably won't match because the dot hash is null here or something, or this thing here is probably busted. So this code will probably blow up before you get here. But let's say, uh, you know, you just had like a next in here directly afterwards and you didn't have this return. Let's get rid of all this crap. Well, if you do something like this, let's say you aren't even checking the hash for some dumb reason, but you just decide that you want to write this code you wouldn't actually get an error here. So this would work just fine. This would send a 401 back to the browser and then you would call next. And let's say you were doing like a get student here, you would actually get an error here when you tried to respond. Like the first res dot whatever here is where Node.js is going to error, but this isn't the problem. The problem is that you already sent a status code and then you let express.js progress to the next thing so that's why you need this return here to make sure that you don't call next unless that's the only thing you call you either call a res.send status or you call next you don't call both and if you don't call either then it's just going to hang here it's never going to send anything to client and it's never going to run any of your downstream code any more questions about this before i go back to filter sort page name Anybody? Okay. So, uh, I think you got everything to do the quiz. Um, I will talk a little bit about, I don't know, what is 10%? Five minutes or 15 minutes? <laughs> 15? All right. So, filter sort page in it. You pass in the type. You pass in the array of items that you got, and this is out of order, right? So I'm gonna talk about query args last. So this is the all of the items that you built up with your promise.all. So you did S members, or you did a, or if you're doing grades, then you for loop up to the counter. Either way, uh, you have this thing and you have to do a bunch of H get alls, and each one of those is gonna give you back a student object or a grade object or whatever stupid function you're in. So all of those things should aggregate into one big array of objects. That's what this items thing is. Items is just an array of all the objects you got out of the database. And query args is the request dot whatever is in the, the whatever is after the question mark in the URL. So if we go back, where is my browser? If we go back over here and we look at the request object and we try and figure out which one that is, I think, nope, it is not params, it is query. That's right. So if I do something like this, then rec.query.q, because that's this first thing, q is going to be Toby Ferret, all right? If I have multiple things inside there, then rec.query is going to be a hash object. It's gonna have keys for order 
it's going to have keys for shoe of color and shoe of type. We don't really do any of this stuff. Like, don't worry about the color and the square bracket stuff. That's kind of crazy. But yeah, so we don't mess with any of that. But you will have top level keys for order for, say, for example, down here. If we look at this, the res.query, uh, res, no, request.query, sorry. Rec.query is going to have a, underscore, a key called underscore sort and a value of type. It's going to have another key called underscore order and a value of ASC. You want to take the entire query object and pass it in as your query args. So over here, when you're calling this, you probably just want to like, if you're calling filter sort paginate from get students, you just would pass the string student in as your first argument. You're, and if you're calling it from grades, you would just pass this string grade in as your first argument. The rest of these things will probably be about the same because query args is always, should always just be when you're passing in rec.query. You just want to take the entire blob of all the query key value pairs and pass it into filter sort page name because it knows which of those things to look for at every stage. It knows that when it's filtering, it only needs to look in query args for these keys. And then it knows when it's down to trying to do sorting, it knows that it needs to look for, or this is, that's not sorting. Um, when it's doing sorting, it knows it needs to look for the underscore sort and underscore order keys. And when it's doing the pagination, it knows it needs to look for start, end, and limit out of query args. So it, it, it tries to pull all of the stuff out of query args and just picks out what it needs for every stage of the filtering, the sorting, and the pagination. Um, and then the third one is your items. Like I said, you're going to pass in, you know, you, you've dot then all of your H get alls, and then you wrapped all of that in a promise dot all. So, you know, you do your, and I, don't we have that code still? Where is that code? Um, is this it? Hmm. I don't remember. I think this is it. Oh, well, we, I wrote that code a little while ago. I think I posted it in Slack how, how you know you need to use your dot then on every single request, H get all request, and combine all that stuff to, you know, use that to write into your overall array. Wait till your promise dot all gets called, like this thing here. So, yeah. So, for example, we did a for loop. And we're going from zero to a dot length. So we're trying to for loop through this array of IDs, kind of like what you would do for grades, except you would just be looping up to whatever the, the current counter is in the database or whatever. So you do a database request. And inside each single request like that, you do a dot then and you add whatever answer you got from the database into all, an array of all your answers. It's defined way up here outside the scope of everything. Okay, you, you do that. So by the time all of this, all of these are finished, this should have all of the items you were looking for. And you also push this whole promise into your array of promises. So when this dot then finishes, you now know that the array all answers is fully populated because when this dot then gets called, it means all of these dot thens that were created in the for loop have by definition already been called and completed. So this, inside this dot then, is where you would call filter sort paginate. And also where you would take the answer from filter sort paginate and pass it back to the user along with the X total count, all that jazz. Make sense? Anybody have any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. So when you're setting grades in students, in the database, would it be like student colon and then whatever other keys it has? Or is it all going to be under a user? Uh, so user is just for authentication purposes. Students okay. are their own top level thing. So each student colon, I don't know, Bradley or Craig B or whatever, each of those are stored by the student ID. Kind of like how okay. users are stored by the user ID. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is because for students, we have to be able to like 
make sure that this student doesn't exist, that we aren't overwriting it. We want to be able to loop through all of the students and get all of them really quickly without looking through the entire Redis database for everything that starts with students. So that's why we also have the set. So the S members yeah. and S add and all that jazz. We have all that there for students. For grades, it's going to be grade colon one, grade colon two, grade colon three, that sort of thing. Because for grades, everything is, no grades have a unique ID. It's just we generate one when we save it the first time and then we increment that counter. Okay. So, so the auth checking would be the user, like h get all user plus the creds.name, not just h get all creds.name. Correct. Yep. Okay, cool. And if we look at our project five redacted, yeah, that's, so that's the only thing that we do with users is to validate this. And this is the only user in the database, unless you have more code here that adds more users, which I'd, okay. I mean, good luck with that. But <laughs> So here's what we actually set. So your H get all will probably mirror that. But a user is only used for authentication. A user has nothing to do with uh, with like the students or or grades or anything like that. Okay. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Coryargs is an array. Coryargs is a is an object hash key value pairs, not zero through five index. So the keys would be like underscore sort and underscore ascending or descending and underscore uh, start limit end and then whatever other stuff that you want to like filter on like ID type. Those will all be keys inside query args and they would all have values associated with them. Query args is not like zero is Bob and you have to figure out what index zero means because they can be in any order when they're on the, uh, when they're on the URL bar. And they have key value pairs. Their key equals value on the URL bar. So Coryargs is nice enough to put them with their key values into an object instead of an array. <clears throat> Any other questions? I think this is answered in the Slack, but how do we keep track of the number of grades it's like you have grade one grade two grade three is um, that um let me see where did i i think i put that in here did i list off the database yeah grades so there's a top level key called grades in the database that just holds the number of grades so far that's like when we did oh, the okay. incr the increment stuff mm -hmm. if grades doesn't exist it'll set it to one and then it'll continue incrementing it. So every time you want to add a user, you just do call increment. All right, well, sorry, whenever you want to add a grade, first thing you do is call increment. Okay. That'll return the new value of this grades key. So mm -hmm. anchor on grades, that'll return a five or whatever. Even if grades doesn't exist in your database, it'll set it to one, it'll set it to zero, increment it to one and give you the number one back. And then that's your ID to add new stuff. Okay, 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 cool. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> So anybody else have any questions before we get back to the quiz and possibly complaining about when the project is going to be due? When is this due? Ooh, November 8th. It's coming up quick, right? Need extension. <laughs> I feel like as a computer science professor, it's my, uh, at Clemson, and as being a student of computer science professors at Clemson, I guess I'm not a professor, I'm an instructor, because I don't have a PhD or anything, but I feel like it's a time-honored tradition to uh, make people sweat for a little bit and then push the project out at the last minute, so, you know, maybe I'll do that. I guess it's close enough to the last minute. I'll, let's see, it's, uh, so the eighth... That's Sunday, okay. And you want me to push it to Wednesday? I don't know, man. I mean, I guess I could start talking about React on Monday. Tuesday? Uh, yeah, announce the extension 1157. Yeah, exactly. Wednesday was a compromise? No, it wasn't. 
after Thanksgiving. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I will push it back till Tuesday. You get the 10th at 1159. Eleven ten. All right, go team. Y'all win this round. All right. I guess I need to save this. Okay, so at eleven fifty nine. Yep, eleven ten. Isn't that what I put? Yeah, eleven ten, eleven fifty nine. Yeah, well, that's what's in there. Let me double check. Pretty sure that's what that means. Oh yeah, November tenth, eleven fifty nine. Eleven eleven at eleven eleven. Negative. Nope. I will. I will budge no further. <laughs> and uh, you guys also, y'all, guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, also have a quiz. What day is today? Today's the fourth. So we got a quiz on app.use. And maybe some basic auth stuff if you're lucky. And uh, Razmataz is the password. I guess I could put that into Slack because some of y'all can't spell. Look, it's on the screen. Look, it's right here. R-A-Z-Z-M-A-T-A-Z-Z. <laughs> And I put it in the general chat. So enjoy that. Get out of here. Enjoy your uh, early, I guess it's like 20 minutes early. That's not too bad. No, the next code it will not be any student names. Oh yeah, and don't forget to like and subscribe to YouTube. <laughs> Outro music. And if y'all want to see more content like this, I'll see y'all on Monday because I really don't care if you subscribe to my channel. <laughs> A giveaway. I just, I just gave away a project extension. Exclusives. <laughs> Wait till you take the quiz. There's actually a little bit of a giveaway on today's quiz too. Unless somebody's playing WoW and, you know, doesn't really read the question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like five points, too. It's pretty juicy. All right. Hit me up in the comments. I'm out.